greet you in Jesus' name this morning. It's a blessing to be here. Um, we often say in God's house with God's people, but among God's family, I, I, I find rest here coming to church. I, because of what visitors that are here, uh, I was reminded of, of, of one more thing that, that I kind of missed in my studies. And uh, maybe I'll just just uh, tell you, I, I felt led to share uh, about uh, Joshua and life lessons from Joshua. And uh, I thought of three words, three things, three character uh, attributes that we we often, and maybe you don't think about it so much, but I, in, in our line of work and communicating with, with customers and people, something that we often stand around and talk about is the lack of commitment and faith in our culture. Commitment, faith, and courage to stand up and go forward in the, in the Christian walk. And I'm going to add one more, just because I, I thought of it and Leroy stressed it, and that is the, the, the fourth one is faithfulness. Uh, I couldn't help but sit here and think that, I don't know, numbers, I mean, years-wise, maybe it was about 70 or 75 years ago, there was a young couple that had a plan or, or a faith that they carried with them and their young family to church. And today, grandchildren, maybe great-grandchildren are sitting here because of their faith. It influenced and it kept, and it keeps on influencing. And tell me your father-in-law's name. I'm sorry, Wallace Byler, Wallace Byler and his wife. Uh, it it blesses me that 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 took place all those years ago, and it's still affecting generations today. And I'm sure that you you know your family along the way. There may have been casualties uh, that that probably happened. But still, they had a, a desire to serve the Lord, and that desire carried forward till today. That is a blessing. And so uh, I guess my, I, I was a bit disappointed that there were no preachers here, but I, that's, I'll have to overcome that and keep going. So ne just keep that in mind for your next reunion. Try to bring your preachers to church. But be that as it may, we'll keep going. Uh, we... Beyond that, uh, for all the rest of us that aren't related to the, the Byler family, we have a, a, if we serve the Lord, we, have, we are also a part of a family. And even if we don't have a 70 or 100 year heritage, we can start today because they started somewhere too. And so I hope that whatever I share this morning is an encouragement to, to start if we are not if we haven't started, but to keep going. And faithfulness is, is that aspect of it. I, uh, in the reason I'm talking about the subject this morning, I read through the first 11 chapters of Joshua now in my personal devotions, and I was impressed with the life of Joshua. And I, you could choose any, uh, you could choose Moses, you could choose Daniel, you could ju uh, choose Joseph, you could talk about Jesus' life, and all of those have, have things that, and I, I want to do more than just share some facts. We can all, all of us are capable of just giving some facts, but let's think about how it affects us today. So we first read about Joshua in Exodus chapter 17, verse 9, and uh, this is the time when uh, Moses, they, were, they started out, I believe, and they came to the Amalekites, and they were at war, or they fought with them. And Joshua was on the battleground, and Moses, I think it was Aaron and a man named Hur. I, I failed to study or read that again, but uh, they were under Moses' arms, and as long as Moses' arms stayed up, uh, Joshua prevailed and his men, but there was Joshua. And just some uh, things uh, where we, uh, I'm, I'm not going to be reading a lot, just maybe talking a little bit here and there where we, we see Joshua again. 
When the time came for them to send the 12 spies, he was one of them. He went with the, the 12 men that, that were chosen. What I'd like to read for a text then is Numbers chapter 14 uh, and, and reading from verse 6 to 12, not a real long uh, passage there. Uh, this is the time then when they came back and they gave their report. And we, we don't read much about Joshua here. We don't read, but we read enough to know who, what his, his focus was. And Joshua, uh, we read about him in Numbers uh, 14, start at verse 6. You may stand if you want while we read uh, for those that can and want to. Verse 6, And Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that, that searched the land, rent their clothes. Maybe give a little bit of background. We know the story. We're all Bible readers. But the other ten had said, not possible. There are giants over there. There are things in that land that, that prevent us from going forward. There, there's no way. We know we've all heard this before. But here are Joshua and Caleb. And among not just the ten, but the crowd, they, they, I don't know if they calmly said it, but somehow they rent their clothes, so they must have been pretty passionate about what, passionate about what they were saying. And they spake unto all the company and the, of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then we, he will bring us into this land and give it us, a land which floweth with milk and honey." Only rebel not, not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their defenses departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. But all the congregation bade stone them with stones, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses, How long will this people provoke me, and how long will it be ere they believe me for all the signs which I showed among them. I will smite them with the pestilence and disinherit them and will make of thee a greater nation and mightier, mightier than they. I'm going to stop reading there. You may be seated if you like. So there's not, there's not much. We don't read much about Joshua here, but we do understand where Joshua was and where his focus was. He said, if God is with us, along with Caleb, then we, we can do it. There, there's, uh, he supported Caleb, and, and those two stood together in trusting God. They, they had their eyes, uh, maybe not so much on the big crops over there and the fruits that they had, but they had their, when they spoke, they said, if God is with us, we can do it. They didn't say, we need to go fight for those, that big cluster of grapes or we've, they've got things that we want. But they, they just, they had the courage to focus on God. And again and again, I want to come back to those, those words, courage, commitment, and faith. I would say that, that those are the three or one of the, the group of, of characteristics that our society so desperately needs today. We need commitment, we need courage, and we need faith to keep, to stay where we're at, to keep going. Now, I'd like to talk about something that I can only, I, I grappled with this a little bit, but it is something that I believe all people that are my age, older, even younger, have faced and will face in their journey with the Lord. As noteworthy as his courage was and his faith, and we should be talking about that. There, there's that, that, that's something that we should be talking about. As noteworthy as that was, something that really struck me was the silence that we have on Joshua for a lot of years, a lot of years between when Joshua said, we can do it, until they actually did it. Some of the things that he could have, we could be reading in, in his, 
story that we don't read. And sometimes what, what we don't read is as important as what we read. He could have been the biggest whiner in the camp. If only you would have listened to me and, and Caleb. If you, if you just would have, you know, we would not be walking around in this wilderness. We wouldn't be having a funeral every couple weeks we, or days. I don't know. There were many that died in that in the journey because of their hard-heartedness. I told you it's going to happen. All of these things we could read. We wouldn't need to be here if you listened to me. If only you would have just paid attention. We had a message for you. But all of these things you don't read. You don't hear, you don't hear from Joshua. Or he could have said, if that's the way you're going to treat me, I'm out of here. I've got better places. My talents, my time, my effort, there are better places for me to go. I don't need to be here. This is a bunch of uh, hard-hearted hotheads or whatever, cowards. I don't, I don't want to associate with these people. All of these things you don't read, you don't hear. Joshua was in a season of silence, and I like to reflect on that a little bit because I think that is something that we all have to grapple with. And maybe I'm, well, I, th I think it is true that we have to grapple with this. You know, when we talk often, when we hear messages uh, about Joshua, what is the most famous thing that Joshua said? Someone help me out. What did Joshua say? We'll get to that. Someone. Yes, we like to stand up and say that. That is, and I, I want to get to that. I, I think that's good. But there's something about the character building that went on in all those years where we don't read of Joshua, and then he reappeared. And, and he, he walked into, well, his character just reflects that he was faithful all of those years. So how is your season of silence? I, I'm just going to imagine that to this morning there are some of you sitting here that perhaps feel like you are in a season where you're not, you, you, it feels like a season of silence. You, you don't, you've prayed, you've kept on going, you've, you've given your tithes, you've done your acts of service, you've gone to church, you've blessed other people, you've, you've walked the road. And yet it feels like you're in the hallway and there are doors that just don't open. The season of silence. And you know, it's in those moments when we're tempted to ask, God, where are you? What are you, what, what is it that you're wanting me to do? Where, where do you want me to go? Are you still listening to my prayers? Uh, are you still there? Where, where are you at? Does my praying and, and giving even make a difference? You know, it's at that moment that the, that the devil wants to capitalize and, and move in and have people give up and start going a different direction. But I'm here to encourage us this morning, don't stop. Keep going. Stay faithful. Stay where you're at, where you, God has posted you. Keep going. It is also a huge opportunity for character building. You know, um, God has many reasons why he takes us through storms and valleys and times when we don't quite know where he's leading us and what's going to happen next. He has many reasons. I don't even want to start trying to line up why God does what because it might be different in your life than it is in mine. But he has many reasons. But the thing that I want to encourage us with is that if we stay faithful, God is building. God is in the business of building character in those silent times. And we are called to faith. We are called to move forward by what we believe, not always by what we see and what we're feeling. And God does care about tomorrow. So let's not get discouraged and, and quit. This, in my, when I was studying, I came across this quote, and I don't know this man, but he said this, faith is not 
in what I see, but in what God has already said. And, and I just added this to my notes. Faith is often an action, not a feeling. You know, if we always think we have to feel something before we can act on it, if we know what God wants, let's go forward. I think often the world does, has, around us has a hard time understanding what faith looks like if everything turns out perfectly and it just kind of, the red carpet just kind of rolls out in front of us. We are not able to show the world uh, what faith actually looks like. So now let's, let's move on to Numbers 27, verse 18. I'm going to read this and then just make note of it and move on. So here now, Moses getting to the end of his life, read the, I'm going to read this in the NIV, uh, Numbers 27, 18. So the Lord said to Moses, take Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the spirit of leadership, and lay your hand on him. So here we go now, Joshua reappearing after all these years that, that the Bible is silent about Joshua. And he had the spirit of leadership. There was something going on as he trudged through that, that wilderness. There was, there was something that developed in, or kept developing in him that God knew that he was, he was material for leadership. He didn't give up. He didn't run away. He didn't spew his anger. If he did, I don't know. We don't read about it. He just kept going. And so here is, here is Joshua again. What amplifies the message of Joshua's character is the fact that he was committed. He, he was, you know, we could have just read for the last time about Joshua when he was one that wanted to go forward, but here he is. He's, he was committed to his people, to his nation, to the cause, and most of all, to God. We could make a, a long we could talk about the fact that we're unable to lead unless we're able to submit. If we're not able to, to follow, we cannot lead. It doesn't seem to work. So I, I, have to, I, I don't want to uh, go over time this morning. I'm just going to kind of skip through this. We, I wanted to read Joshua chapter 1, uh, verse 1 to 9, but I think I'm just going to uh, read a few verses um, as we go. So now Joshua, as a leader, um, speaks, in, in, or we, we read of him in, in verse, chapter 1, verse 2 of Joshua. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I, I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Joshua, God was talking to Joshua, Joshua chapter 1. And, and there often, in, in times of stress and distress, uh, there are a few verses here where God spoke to Joshua that are huge encouragement to me or have been in the past. I'm sure others have shared them with you as well. So, but what I want to see here at, at this juncture is that now Joshua, the leader, the man that was called to lead. And if I would have been in Joshua's shoes and had any choice, I probably would have said, I, I, don't, I don't really want to lead these people. They, they're hard-hearted, they don't want to hear from you as God, I really would prefer not to be a part of this. But he was willing. And about the first thing that Joshua faced was that river between them and the promised land. Now, it would have been so much easier if God somehow would have built the miracle bridge across that river so Joshua wouldn't have to face that, that river. The challenge of getting... I don't know, a million and a half people uh, across that river. But, you know, Joshua was a man that had learned to walk with God, and he trusted God, and he was committed to God. And so I, I, I think that what, whatever we accomplish in life, whatever Joshua accomplished in life is really to glorify God. That's why we're here. We are not, this is not a message to glorify the man, but the character of God within the man. 
And so I want to reflect a little bit on the miracles that happened uh, for Joshua and the people there. The river uh, that stood still. You know, I, I don't know if, if you've struggled with this, but sometimes things in life just happen. And all of a sudden, you're like, Lord, how am I going to get through this? There's just no way. I don't, th this wasn't supposed to happen. This, this is not, this doesn't, I don't feel comfortable with it. And I can't sleep because I'm just, my mind is just wrapped around this thing. And, and I don't know if the river, Jordan River was, was that way for him or, or how he felt about that. But in uh, Joshua chapter 3, verse 15, I think this is in the NIV. Now, the Jordan is at flood stage all during harvest. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarathan, Zarathan while the water flowing down to the Sea of Arabah, that is the Dead Sea, was completely cut off. So the people crossed over to the opposite and into Jericho. And so I, the miracle that God worked in all that happened to Joshua, it was always about God working his way and allowing them to, to reach or to, uh, to gain the objective or, or to get through. So that, in my mind, was the first miracle. But God told Joshua, and I don't know how all this worked, because I have not audibly heard God speaking to me. Now, we know what the word says. But uh, it worked. And that million and a half people, or however many people that, that walked across, you know, we grew up hearing this story. It's almost not a big deal. Jordan River, yeah, they walked across. Had I been there that day in Joshua's shoes? and watch that procession, I don't know what I would have done. Probably rejoice that, that it was happening. So what other miracles uh, happen? The, the walls of Jericho falling our miracles is a miracle that we've talked in our Bible school and our Sunday school lessons from little up. We just, you know, we just know that they walked around and then the seventh day, or I don't even have the facts may be completely straight. They walked around seven times, and then they marched toward the wall, and boom, there it was. Again, God, through Joshua and his people, magnified himself. What other miracle do you think of that happened in Joshua's watch that, is, that was phenomenal? Someone. Something that never happened since then that I know of. The sun stood still. I, I just marveled at that. The sun, uh, they needed that extra time. And, and, and Joshua, again, if I would have been in his shoes, perhaps it would have been my nature to see, can I bring extra rec recruits in here? Can we bolster this thing? Can we, uh, you know, get more men behind it? But no, he stopped and he asked God, what, what should we do? And God responded and the sun stood still. Something that really touched me, and I, I know I've read this verse many times, and, and people have, have shared it with me. Joshua 1, 7, only be thou strong and very courageous. The first part, I, I could quote to you. I, people say that. Be strong and very courageous. We say that to each other. The second part was something that I kind of skimmed over that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. And I started thinking about the, the, the second part of it, and I thought, you know, there is a clear line, at least in the Old Testament, between the obedience to God and the success and the blessing of the people. And I think there's a clear line in history, all those that walked in obedience to God, that, that blessing, while it didn't always feel like a blessing, tended to follow. And all of a sudden I thought, you know, the value of a standard, the value of a, and I'm not talking maybe perhaps just like a church standard, but I'm saying the value of godly principles as a standard brings blessing. God promised Joshua 
that. And, and I think that it's worth noting, that segment of the verse is worth noting. God promised him that there would be blessing as long as he was obedient. And that followed all, all the people for uh, the nation. Now, we can't help but look at a few of the weaknesses that Joshua had. And hopefully there's something that we can learn from, from a few of these failures. You know, we, I, I learn sometimes the, the best when I failed the deepest. I, uh, I don't know how that works for you, or uh, <clears throat> sometimes there, there are things that just go sideways, and that's where it really em embeds itself in my brain, and, and otherwise I would not have learned some of these things. But looking at Joshua's life, just not, not uh, diving deep into Scripture, just a few of the things that we already know, some of the weaknesses, and what can we learn from it. Uh, it, it makes Joshua more human to me, and it helps me to, to see that despite his background of commitment and faith and courage, he still needed God at every turn. Every, there is no place for men, men or women to get to the place where we've got all this experience loaded behind us, and now we can just, we've got it. So something happens, well, okay, I'll just think about my experience. No, we always need God. After this huge success in Jericho, what happened next? They went for, someone help me out, AI. And we know what happened. Now, I, I read the story, and we know that Achan failed, and there was sin in the camp. There, were, there was hidden sin, and we often talk about hidden sin, but there's something else that happened. I tried to figure out if Joshua ever asked God if they should move forward, and I couldn't find it. And so I, that is something that I'd like to, to present to us this morning. The Bible says in Joshua 7, 2, simply that, and this is just a part of the verse, he sent out men. So it was time to move on to the next place. And logically, humanly speaking, that was the next town in, in line. So let's go. So Joshua sent out men. And it was disaster, defeat. Joshua ended up with his face to the ground. And I guess what I'd like for us to think about, beyond the, the, the sin of Achan and the, the purging that went on there, Think about the fact that we never get to the place, I, I don't care how minute, how small, where we shouldn't stop and ask God, what do you think? And in prayer, I'm saying, and pray about it, and fast if, the, if you're inclined to do that. So what can we learn? Past victories never exempt us from asking God about the future. Just because we were successful back there doesn't mean that we'll just, we don't need God anymore. Well, we know we don't, we don't get to that place, but we kind of, there's that temptation to, to stand on our own platform and forget about asking God. Our, our commitment to seeking his will should be just as firm after a victory as it is uh, when we're desperate for victory. The other thing that happened, uh, and this is when the Gibeonites came with their moldy bread and, and they claimed that they'd traveled from afar, and, and Joshua, I'm not sure, I, as I read the story, and you can read it for yourself, I'm not sure if it was Joshua that made the decision to, to sign a peace treaty with them or if it was his princes. But in either case, it was a failure, and they should have stopped and said, God, what do you want us to do? How should we uh, respond to this? And so I guess what I'd like for us to think about is something that, that uh, sometimes, I know people get frustrated with it, but sometimes people say things like, they ask a question, and the standard answer is, well, let me think about that a little bit. Well, that's just a preacher buying time. But that might be a security in let's, let's pray. Let's think about what God wants us to do here. And I don't know if that's what happened. He kind of 
shot from the hip there and, and uh, immediately uh, sized it up and said, okay, yeah, you're way out there. Yeah, we'll make a peace treaty. But it wasn't long until they realized how, what had happened. And something else that, that Joshua kind of seemed to fail in was completely driving the Canaanites out like he was supposed to. And we could spend a, a good little while on this. It caused him much grief in the years to come. He did not completely drive out all the Canaanites. And we, can, we could talk about the, our personal lives and how we're, we're supposed to drive out sin and, and push back and, and completely our, our goal should be, by the grace of God, to not go for 50% or 60%, but our all and driving out the enemy, um, whatever that might be. And then the last one, I don't know if I uh, should even mention this one, but it seemed like Joshua didn't really replace himself as a leader. He... When he died, when he passed on, uh, Joshua 24, verse 31 says, And Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that overlived Joshua, which had known all the works of the Lord that he had done for Israel. And so, but soon in Judges, we read where they started to worship idols and, and they would have a leader and then they would go up and down. And I'm not sure if, if it's worth paying attention to it, but I, I really think that uh, uh, Moses and his, his ability to appoint Joshua, if that could have carried through, that might have saved them a lot of grief. And, and again, I, I feel like I'm being harsh uh, on Joshua. So what can, we, what can we learn from that? And I just simply would say, without going in a lot of detail, it doesn't matter if you're old or a teenager, we should never stop trying to develop the next generation. Never stop trying to, to lift up the next generation so that leaders can rise and move on. And I'm not just leaders, but we need everyone. The team can go forward. And I'm thinking that he, he did that. Now, one more thing before I close here. Joshua's most famous words, and we already heard it, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You know, in growing up in almost every special service, whether it was revival meetings or youth fellowship meetings or wherever it was, this is the verse. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And I think it's noteworthy coming from Joshua. <clears throat> as I uh, <clears throat> thought about this verse, it, I had a different perspective. You know, when I say that verse, when I hear it said, there's something that rises up within me that gives courage to say, uh, wherever the world goes, me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. That's commitment. That's expressing commitment. But why could Joshua say that, and today, after all these thousands of years, we're still repeating his phrase? How, what gives validity to his statement? You know, I, I can say that, we can say that, but there's something that stirred within me. And th this is the thing that, that really brought me to, to thinking about this whole message. Uh, there is a lot of complaining that goes on in a, the world around us. They are looking for, the, there is a longing for a, a group of people that kind of embodies principles that don't change and that keep going. And we have many people that come to this area and kind of look at us and they, it seems as though they kind of, sometimes I told someone that, man, they should, seems like they should put us in a cage and just kind of look at us. We're kind of like in a zoo. They think we've got it together. It's not true. We have problems just like the rest of the world. But the world, when, when there's this, how do we amplify the message? And I'm going to say the message of God. God has put us here to bring glory to him. So we often hear a, maybe a song or something and, or someone thinks it's a beautiful song, whether we do or not, they turn up the volume. So I'm going to ask you this morning, in your mind, and as you leave here, as you think about this, this statement, how do you turn up the volume on your faith? I'm going to suggest something, 
And the reason that this statement that Joshua made has turned up the volume so that we hear it even now in 2022, it's because of the life of commitment and faith that Joshua lived. Had he lived a, faith, had he lived a life that would have called into question whether he was actually authentic or not, that would have meant nothing. And I've discovered in my few years that there is not much as powerful as a faithful walk. I mean, some people say very little, but their, their faith and their faithfulness and their commitment is what brings validity to the statement. And so I, I'm just going to suggest that if you want to turn up the volume in your neighborhood on the message of God, then stay faithful. Commit yourself to staying faithful. If you want to lead others, first of all, make sure you have a solid commitment on your part. I think that is the, the, maybe the only way that we turn up the volume of faith in our communities and in our world. And I can tell you with assurance that the world is looking for it. There are people that are hungry for it. There are people that are moving in this community right now because they want to be close to what they perceive as a community that is filled with faith and there's peace here. If you want to turn up the volume, be committed. And I'm saying commitment sometimes goes places where we don't, no one else sees it. No one else sees us in our prayer closet. No one else sees us preparing for the Sunday school lesson. Commitment. Be committed, be faithful, and walk with courage in faithfulness. And God will bless us, and the volume goes up. Let's stand and have a word of prayer.